for the Christian recall of the Word of God is part of walking by means of the Holy Spirit. I know you've had that occasion when you're in a conversation with somebody and you, and you, you, you go like, oh, what is that scripture? I know I've got that thing. And, and then if you just relax and let the Holy Spirit, he'll reveal it to you. Just relax. Don't get, don't get panicky. Just relax. He'll reveal it to you because part of his job is to teach and recall. Teach and recall. Well, if I can find my Thessalonians again. First Thessalonians 2. So in verse 9, Paul says, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 9, Paul says, For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God. You know what we are? We're the witnesses of God, aren't we? You are witnesses, and so is God, how devotely and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. So, this is a reason for exhorting, encouraging, employing of parenting other believers who are at different stages of their spiritual growth maturity and why it falls upon us when we realize that to instruct, to, to exhort, encourage, implore each one of you as a father would have, so that you would walk, peripateo, you would walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Look, 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 there's two parts of this, and I, want you to, I don't want you to miss it. There's two parts of, of your witness of God in your life. There's two witnesses of God ex described here uh, as, as you study the word of God. Watch this now in verse 10. The first witness is how you, how you live it. Devoutly, uprightly, and blamelessly in our behavior. I mean, some people, all people, I suppose, because he made, made it such a big point, pay attention to our behavior. Sometimes our behavior speaks louder than our words, doesn't it? Our behavior, and he describes how your behavior should be among other people. Among other people, even your own family. I mean, sometimes we think we can behave one way with our family and another way with the world. You know, that's not true. You should be consistent in the way you behave with God. But anyhow, notice devoutly uprightly and blamelessly. And then the second part of this is how we talk to them. One is how we behave and the other is how we talk to them. And I find that to be interesting when he says, just as you know, just as you know how we spoke to you, we exhorted you, we encouraged you, we implored each of you, like a parent. It has nothing to do with age. It has to do with information. It has to do with other people's spiritual place in their life and how we behave with them and how we talk to them. And I find this to be exhorting, encouraging, imploring. And for what purpose? so that others that are influenced by your behavior and your speech as a witness for God to their life, it witnesses to God to their life, so that you know how we were, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God. 
Your behavior is a witness of God. Your speech is a behavior of God. And, and it's not just speech. But notice how he wants you to speak to people, encouraging, exhorting, imploring uh, people uh, to connect with God. To connect with God. And the reason is we want people to connect with God so that they can walk in a manner worthy of God who calls us. And you remember Perry Pateo now. Perry Pateo, you put a circle on your paper, and that's Perry Pateo. Inside that circle, you put a dot. And then you begin to divide that circle from that dot into sections of your life based on who you are in your life. And a lot of times you don't realize, and that's your sphere of influence. That is your greatest ministry in life is in that circle. And a lot of times you don't realize because you never stop to put that circle on your paper, put a dot in it, and then just divide your life up. You know, look, you're a person, you, do you have parents? Do you have grandparents? Do you have aunts and uncles? Do you have kin people? See, if you're, if you're a child and your parents are alive, then that's one section. If you have brothers and sisters, that's another section. If you have aunts and uncles and that, that's another section. If you have a job, that's another section. If you have friends, that's another section. If you go to school, that's another section. If you gotta go to church, if you go <laughs> gotta go to church, if you go to church, that's another section. If you live in a community with other people, there's another section. If you live in an apartment complex, there's a section. If you go to a gym, there's a section. If you have a favorite restaurant you go to on a regular basis, that's a section. You understand what I'm saying? That's Perry Pateo. And that is, your, that is your great, greatest influence at any given time. Now, sometimes those things change inside the circle. Would you agree? You change jobs. You change neighborhoods. You know, people die and things of that nature. And, and that, but... And so that circle, inside that circle, is constantly changing. A lot of areas are constantly changing or, or periodically changing. But that's your, greatest, that's your greatest influence. Some of you have great ministries that take you outside of your community. That's, that's another part of that. That's your life. And... Um, every time you see this word walk, not, not probably not every time, but probably most of the time that work is going to be peripateo. There's another word that is used for walk, but it's a more technical word, uh, stokeo, and that means uh, to walk in step or to march, like a, uh, in the military. You, you run together, you march together. In a band, you march, a marching band. Perry Patel is, a, is an enormous thing. It's, it's, it's where your greatest influence for Christ is. Sometimes your job, if you're, in the, if, if you're in the sales kind of thing, your job takes you into all kinds of places, doesn't it? I'm amazed when I go out with Billy. Uh, you know, I, I, I used to be, this is my son Billy. Now it's, this is my dad, Ron. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, that circle changed in my life. Right there, that circle changed. But I'm, I'm amazed when I go out with him. I'm just about to go into any community around Birmingham, and, and people know Billy because he's a salesperson. And he knows a whole lot of people. Well, so that sphere of influence. And so he, our watch this now. Our behavior and our speech around people to try to influence them towards God, it's really important. Now, that, that should be a commonplace behavior and speech. You, you need to get your life in such a way that that's your norm and standard. You just don't put on 
you know, we used to call it put on the dog. I, you, the, you just don't put this on just because you're in another group. This ought to be your norm and standard. This is the person God sees. F for example, I'm starting to preach, ain't I? Let's have prayer. Remember the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Mental attitude types, sins of the tongue, overt sins. Because of your, you live under the new covenant church age, you're a believer priest, you need to make your own confessions to the Father to have your own cleansing of your life for spirituality. Confess your sins, you get out of carnality and back into spirituality. And the Father, Father always wants to have a conversation with you about your carnality. Why are you choosing carnality over spirituality? And you need to listen to that conversation that the Holy Spirit will give you with the Father. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God today as we look at a church's missionary ministry. We are at the end of February, Father. This is a month that we dedicate uh, prayers and our thoughts and our money towards our foreign missionaries, the guys and gals who got their boots on the field, the Myers, the Morgans, the Williams, the Sextons, the Molinars. Father, we do not know where the Sextons are. We do not know, as a church body of believers, we do not know. We have not had contact with them. The last time we had any kind of contact, the wife was not doing well. We would certainly appreciate, we do not how to, how to pray anymore within that group other than our general prayer. We don't have specifics. We would like to be in touch with them again. Uh... I lay that upon your desk for approval. And for Sam, Father, uh, the loss of a parent or a mate is an enormous loss. Um, 96 years, I mean, how can we not but thank you? Um, I pray the Holy Spirit would do great ministry within that family over a legacy that's been left behind uh, and uh, placed upon other people to carry forward. Pray for Jeannie. We lift her before you, Father, praying that you would heal her wound. Heal it absolutely, completely, and perfectly, Father. Uh, we have done the medical side of it. We need the miracle side of it. And so we come to you for that. And other prayers, Father, we thank you that you have answered them in such a marvelous way in our life. We thank you for these things. Be with our study today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'll take a look at, I've covered most of, your, of our introduction uh, today. One of the things uh, that we learned from our text in, in my introduction uh, has led me to understand and, and would like to once again thank this congregation for 47 years of your generosity. When I read what Paul had to go through to minister, uh, I am sometimes ashamed <laughs> that I've had it so good. But this church has been a marvelous, generous group to me and my family and my ministry here at Doctrinal Studies. And when I began, I sat down with our board, and they asked me what, what kind of a salary did I want, and I told them whatever they could give me. Whatever they gave me would be sufficient for me to live on. I asked for no salary. I've never asked for a salary. Not one day in my life. The board has always taken care of my needs. How they do that, I don't know. I hope on their knees. I've never asked for a penny, never will. 
It's not who I am. It's not how I minister. And I learned it from Paul. Not to be a burden. I learned it from Paul. And uh, Bill Dennis and that group of people just did it. And whatever they gave me was always enough. It was always enough. And that's a wonderful thing. And, I, and that comes out of grace principle. That's a whole grace principle. That's the way spiritual work should operate, my opinion. It was Paul's opinion as well. And so, you know, a lot of times you run preachers off by taking his money away from them. You'd have to, you'd have to do more than that with me because that's not an issue with me. <laughs> However, your feet, you vote with your feet, that is an issue. But money isn't. I can tell you that right now. And you've been more than generous. You've been more than generous over the years. I would rather live under grace than law any day of my life. And they learned it from Paul when he said in verse 9, Brethren, I have labored with hardships. I have worked night and day, so not to be a burden to any of you so that I might proclaim the gospel of Christ without charge. That was his point. And I've carried that concept in my own life, and almost every man that I knew in this church did it. Every man that I knew that went out into the ministry, went out in the ministry that way, evangelism or pastors. And most of them still live that way. I don't know how to live any other way and wouldn't want to know any other way. <laughs> Grace beats all of them. So I've been here with you under that principle of grace, and you've been wonderful to be in my family, and I couldn't thank you enough. The other thing that I had a privilege of, and you don't realize until you, uh, until you as a pastor, you meet with other pastors. I was, even other doctrinal pastors, I was really fortunate I did not realize how fortunate I was in the beginning of my church stage until later in my life as a pastor here. I started with a, a spiritually mature church. I've spent most of my ministry trying to keep up with you. <laughs> trying to keep up with you. I mean, you require a lot to be fed, and that's fine with me. But I didn't realize when I took the church that I was going to start with a spiritually mature church that required meat. And um, it, it, it didn't take long to dawn on me, however. And so I'm, I'm really fortunate in many ways to have began with a, a spiritual church. And I didn't realize how fortunate I've been until I really got into this and began to study Paul's what Paul had to go through to have ministry. And, and I thought, my goodness, what a wonderful, how God, had, how God had prepared my life. As I was preparing the lesson, I wrote, this is my, this is my diary talk. You know, I, ran, I run a journal. I don't do a diary. That's girly, I guess. But I do a journal. And in my journal, I wrote, as I was preparing this lesson, I began to write down our, our, listen to this, this is phenomenal. I began to write down our missionary ministries, both foreign and home. I got, now most of you, I've known you so long that I could, in my mind, I can visualize you. But I got the church directory out just in case I missed anybody. And I'll tell you what I found was staggering. I, it was staggering in my heart because I was amazed that everyone that I wrote down and I looked up to write down that is actively engaged in our church is engaged in ministry, what I call church missionary ministry. Every one of you. Those who come consistently to this church for study of the Word of God, 
I couldn't, I couldn't put down one name that somebody that I don't know is, has a ministry out of their life into this church. Not one. You know how amazing that is? There are few pastors that could do that. I can tell you that from experience. I was amazed. I was amazed at that. It shows you the power of the word of God in the lives of people who take it serious, how God uses their lives. I was amazed at that. I shouldn't have been, but I was. I was amazed. I found that really important. Everyone who attends on a regular basis in our congregation was included, as well as many who have gone to another geographical location and are engaged in either home or foreign missionary work. Think about that. That's pretty staggering. And that's because this is a spiritual mature church. It has been from the first day we started, and we've tried to maintain that momentum. That's the signs of a spiritual mature people. They, they walk in a manner worthy of the Lord in the, both the way they behave and the way they think and the way they prepare their life and how they treat other people and, and what their goal with other people are. It's a pretty amazing. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. I was, I was happy to write that in my journal. I was, I was really amazed, too. I was really amazed at that. I find when I think of our church and I look at the seven churches of Asia Minor in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2 and 3, and I look at that a lot, try to evaluate my church. I have consistently felt that our church was Philadelphia. I still feel that way. There were only two churches out of the seven churches that, that got a positive report. <laughs> that reached spiritual maturity and maintained it. And one was Philadelphia. And I feel like, as I have studied over the years, we're very close to them. They were the sixth of the seventh churches. And Jesus wrote about them, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no man can shut, because you have little power and know it, have kept my word, faithfully and have not but denied my and have not denied my name no matter the circumstances there's a good report i feel we're close to that today i want to talk about five aspects of a spiritual mature church who is engaged in missionary ministries i want to explain a little bit of that to you I want to go back to my text, and point number one, I want to examine the text. The text is actually written in three Greek words, verse 9, 10, and 11. Uh, verse, uh, verse 9 is a Greek sentence. I didn't bring my Greek book. It's a Greek sentence. I might have wrote it down someplace. Yeah, Greek. verse 9 is a Greek sentence. 10 through 12 is a sentence, and 13 is a sentence in the Greek language. What I found interesting, and when I studied that, I look for markers. I always look for markers. And I found four of them. That gives me a homiletic because they all began with the word W. <laughs> and so it gave me a homiletical idea. Verse 9, when you go back and look at verse 9, you find the word working. You recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, working, working for God. A spiritual mature church is one who is always working for God. 
It means by that not to be a burden to other, but a blessing. Not to be a burden to other people, but a blessing to other people. And the re and one of the things they should be known for is the gospel of Jesus Christ. A clear message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think we, because as custodians, we're responsible for evangelism and the teaching of the word of God. And on one hand, you've got to have a very clear gospel. Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. It's got to be clear what a person has to do in order to be saved by that gospel. He has to believe it for his personal salvation. And there he can understand now as he looks at his life in regard to the shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ that he's been saved by grace through faith and not of himself. It's been a gift from God. The other side of that, of a spiritual mature church, is they've got to be custodians of the of the way the word of God is dissimulated. And it's done by two methods, milk and meat. And they're both for spiritual growth. And that church, spiritual mature church, has to have that going on. You've got to be able to disciple uh, converts and young believers that haven't grown. They have to have milk doctrines of salvation. They've got to be secured in their salvation to be able to move on in the Christian life. And then they become meat eaters and you've got to really teach them the word of God. You've got to teach them how to, to live that Christian life in a, in a victorious way that they understand. It don't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what other people say. I know I'm living for God because the Bible tells me how I'm supposed to do it. Right? You know, it's, you always go back to us. What does the Bible say? And, and that's really important. And, and we have tried to, to be that type of church. We, we're a milk meat church. Uh, most churches, if they've got a clear gospel, they give you a little milk, but that's about the most you get. I was in some very good gospel teaching churches, preaching churches. I, was, I always was starved to death. I, always, I wanted more than I could get. I always walked away from church hungry on how does the word of God work in my life. And we've tr we've, we, try to, we try to remedy that here. We try to be sure that we, f we feed you the proper diet that, that, that you're requiring. Uh, it's kind of interesting, the word working. In the Greek language, it's E-R-G-A-Z-O-M-A-I, E-R-G, and it's in the middle voice. It's in the middle voice in this word, and that middle voice makes that, in the Greek language, makes that an intransitive verb. In other words, there's something inside that working, and what it is, if you read verse 9, what, what, what he's talking about is the gospel. You recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you so that we could proclaim the God, the, to you the gospel of God without charge. That's what he's talking about. So it's, it's just kind of, an, the word is just kind of interesting. It is the idea of working. Ergon is the word for work. Uh, and it's just interesting the way, and so what, when it's inside, in transfer, and it's in, the, the working is towards something, the product is the, what is the product of the gospel? Because he's working hard today so he can proclaim the gospel. What's the product? Because the in, intransitive verb of this idea is I'm working towards your product. So what, was the, what is the product of the gospel? What's the product? Salvation, see? People being saved. See, that's what he means by working. I'm working this way, preaching the gospel this way, so that people can get saved because that's the result of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation everyone who believes. And so it's kind of an interesting word in the Greek language. The middle voice in that make, gives what we call an indirect middle and puts that in an intransitive idea. And, and Paul worked night and day. And I, I'm talking about in a, in a secular job. 
In Acts 18 is where you learn. He's at Thessalonica when you learn that he made tents. He was a tent maker. And, uh, and not as a, a full-time life, but when he, when, he, when he didn't have a support around him, he worked and built his own support. It's just kind of interesting. Working for God means not being a burden to others, especially... Uh, when it involves a grace gospel. For me as a pastor, it involves a grace gospel. As a custodian of a church, custodian out of the custodian idea of pastoring a church, uh, you got to have a gospel, a clear gospel. There has to be a whole gospel ministry as well as a spiritual growth ministry. So grace is a big issue to me, not to be a burden to people. Not to be a burden. Not to be a burden. In verses 10 and 11, I found the word witness. Look down there. You see the word witness in verse 10? You are witnesses and so is God. The word witness is an interesting word in the Greek language. It's mar martyr, M-A-R-T-U-R, where you get the word martyr. Put the Y in it, you get the word martyr. M-A-R-T-U-R is the word in the Greek language. It's a martyr. So English, in the English, we call this word martyr. A witness for God in the way he lives and the way he speaks. He will also, he will also at some times be martyred. I suppose few of us, few of us has had the degree, the, the nth degree of martyr where they hang you up and kill you or something. But we've all, we've all had opposition and persecution for it, have we not? Not to a great, great degree in America, but we've had it. People do it differently in America. They just walk away and talk bad about you behind your back and things like that. They, they stab you in the back figuratively. But a witness to God means spiritually. Now, the word shouldn't be disciplining. Look down there I, where I wrote, th that should be discipling. I didn't spot that until this morning. I was going over my notes. I went, whoa, that's not my job. You know, my job is not to discipline people who are in sin. Whose job is that? Well, he brings conviction, but who brings discipline? The Lord. You know why? He's the savior of the body and the head of the church. He disciplines. You know who the sheep belong to? Nah, come on, Peter. Well, they belong to the Lord. I'm just the under-shepherd. I'm the under-shepherd. Right? And so the witness, the witness, the martyred witness, the witness is devout, upright, and blameless. And, and you should behave like, a, like you're spiritually parenting other people. In verse 11, I found the word walk, peripateo, which I talked to you about. It has the definite article with it. That's a big deal. And our, listen, it, when you find an articulate, what we call an articular uh, infinitive, that's a big infinitive. <laughs> that's a big infinitive. It's a verbal noun. You know, an infinitive is not a mood. It's a verbal noun. It's not a mood. Walk with God, peripateo. Walk with God means to be worthy of God, his kingdom, and his glory in the world. My, my, my. Listen, not only are we a witness to other people, listen, we're a witness to the angelic warfare. The invisible war that we fight. We're a witness to them. Listen, when Jesus would go, go around, when he, when he came up on a person who other people thought was off his rocker, he was demon-possessed, the demons would talk to Jesus. They would go like, hey, you're not going to mess with me, are you? I got a good thing going here. They said, yeah, I'm going to mess with you. Oh, no, it's not the time to be thrown in the lake of fire. No, you're not going to get thrown in the fire right now, but I am going to mess with you. Get out of him. You know why he did it? To prove that he was the Messiah going to hang on a cross for the salvation of the sins of the entire world. 
I know. I know. 13, I found the word, the word of God. Logos, theos, in the Greek. The word of God. Look at verse 13. The word of God. For this reason, for this reason, verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. For this reason, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Our behavior and our speech, worthy. Our worthy walk. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. I want you to write down a verse right there next to 13, Romans 4.21. The word perform, Romans 4.21 explains what it means to perform the word of God. It's a powerful idea. The word perform. You know what's interesting about the word perform? It is, it's, a, it's a concept of the word work. If you, if you had a concordance in the Greek and you wanted to look up the word work or perform, you'd find them in the same place. And they're interesting, a little change they make. For example, up there when he said working, it's E-N-E-R-G. Down here in this word perform, you'd find it in the same category in the Greek. He changes it to, to uh, it, up in the earlier one where it says working, it's E-R-G-A. Down here in performing, it's spelled E-N-E-R-G. The first one, ergon, means a work. I go to work. I have a job. The last one down here, they change it to E-N-E-R. They, 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 they change it just a tad bit with a, with a prepositional idea on it. They change it with a prepositional idea on it, and it means, oh, what do you do? I see you have a job. Just exactly what do you do? I, I know who you work for. What do you, well, to explain what they do, they probably tell you the division. If the company has any size, they tell you what division they're in and what they do in the midst of that. And in the midst of a division of a company, you might be sales or whatever, production or whatever, you would say, well, I'm in this division. And in that division, I do this work. Now we would get down to performance because performance would get down to how you're paid. Huh? I mean, wh why do most of you go to work? To get paid. I mean, it's good that you like your job. I hope you love it. Well, most of us work for salaries. We try to find a job that doesn't mess with our head every day where we just hate to go to work. I've had those jobs, and I didn't stay with them because I felt, I thought, and I was an unbeliever. I thought it was unhealthy to work someplace that you hated to get, get up on Monday morning and crank, crank, crank it up and go. I mean, I thought, I would work in those places, and I think, I would hate to do this the rest of my life. I would just die. And... Uh, I mean, sometimes you have to be in a job. You have to have a job like that. But hopefully, you're looking for something else. You go like this. Oh, I don't find myself doing this the rest of my life. Well, you need to you know, come up with a game plan. I mean, for me, I went through several before I found out what God wanted me to do. I never consulted God for any job but this one. <laughs> I should have, but I didn't. The word of God means to perform, just kind of, it means operative, or what do you do, actually, what do you do, that, in, in other words, that you're getting paid for. Now, of course, Paul didn't take that approach to it, but I'm just trying to bring it to your table. Point number two. In 1 Thessalonians 2.9, Paul explained, as, as we have, 
that the burden should rest on the believing missionary and not on the unbelieving who are receiving the ministry. I can't tell you important. that right, Gary? Now, when Gary, Gary and I sat under a guy, he pounded that so deep in our heart that we were fearful not to do it any other way. <laughs> Now, we, these two guys, plus many, many more like this, a lot of people in this church do, do it that way. This wasn't even optional to us. <laughs> wasn't even optional. I mean, who's going to pay for it? Well, the Lord will pay for it one way or the other. You know, you may have the job. So, Paul reminds those engaged in, listen, this is important for you. Paul reminds those engaged in missionary ministries that they need a universal trade skill, some skill that you could go wherever God sends you and you think you could get along, or be financially independent, or have other believers in churches who are willing to support you. There you have it. There you have it. <laughs> there, that's how it goes. Now, Paul... Paul was not financially independent, so he couldn't do that. But what he did do was the other two. He found a universal trade in where he ministered, the geographics of his ministry, tent making. I don't know what all that engaged. Uh, probably a lot of things more than just what we visualize being a tent. But he did that, and he had individuals, believers, and churches that supported his ministry. That's how he operated his entire ministry. Listen, not only his ministry, but his team. Paul always, always was a team with people. As, as, as he grew in his ministry, the team members were setting under his ministry. Barnabas was equal with him. Silas was equal with him. But later, when you look at Paul's ministry, the men, are, the men have come up from Paul's ministry. Timothy, Titus, Epaphroditus, and the list goes on. He's just an enormous list of people. And when it, whoever he took on missionary trips, he supported them. When it says he went and built, uh, uh, tent made, he did for the team. They were in Thessalonica. Now, I don't know how many of the rest of them, they probably followed his lead and found some work, but... They supported their own ministry until they could get out of Dodge or wherever they were. It's just, it's just good to watch the Word of God. Now, listen, God supports that stuff. That's what God supports. You need to be aware of that. Paul did not want the message of the great, great salvation to have an appearance of chargeable. And when he describes... His ministry there, listen, but listen, this was simple for Paul, and it was simple for a guy like me. It has to be simple, or I don't get it. But it's got to be simple. When Jesus said it's finished on the cross, the price had been paid for the salvation of the world. That's how simple this was to Paul. I'm not going to charge, because that person, I don't want him to get confused that the price has been paid. That's how simple it was, wasn't it? When Jesus on the cross said, it's finished, it was finished. And Paul took that idea. And Paul taught that idea to all the guys who traveled with him. This was part of his ministry of teaching. Paul describes the burden as labor, hardship, working day and night. He discovers it, he describes it as suffering, mistreated, and opposition. One of the things, it used to bother me early in my years because I would look out and I would see churches. They would, their churches would get people and they would stay. Their churches would just grow and grow and grow and grow. And I, I, I said, well, look, 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 what's the deal here? I, come, I, come, I can't do that. The Lord, the Lord sometimes is slow about answers. It made me stick my head in the Word of God and study Paul. I studied Paul's 
I, I studied Paul's ministry, his ministry like you can't believe. And what I discovered, that a teaching ministry, a church who teaches the Word of God for spiritual growth, maturity, and ministry is going to have a revolving door because of ministries. People are going to come in. They're going to, be, they're going to sit down, be trained. They're going to get well-schooled, and they're going to go out because that's how you do it. And when I saw that, I went, cha-ching. Calm down and be content with who God brings you. You're just a halfway house to the world. I'm going to bring them in. You're going to train them. Your church is going to love on them. Your church is going to give the gifts to them as they're here, and they're going to go out, and they're going to do their ministry. And that has been our ministry. This has been the ministry. Ministries have flowed, th have flowed through this church like crazy. I'll tell you, a ministry I think is unique. And for some reason, the young people have lost this concept. And I thought, I need to bring this back in the pulpit and be stronger on it than I have maybe in the last couple few years. I'm going, to tell you some, I'm going to tell you some great ministries that have come out of this church in some of the most unique ways. ROTC. Our, we sent more guys through ROTC to get their education that had enormous ministries of evangelism and the Word of God. That was one way I saw guys have great ministry. We put Tallbush down there at University of Alabama in ROTC, and he lit it up for Christ. He became the, not the general, but the leading guy. What would you call do, do it again. Battalion commander. Battalion commander. I mean, and listen. He lit that thing up for Christ. It wasn't just about the military. He brought an attitude of the word of God. And when he graduated, listen, by the time he graduated, we had guys doing that. Next guy we sent out of here in that was Ed Lacey, who did the same thing in the same position. Then we began to send guys into the military And they began to have great ministries in the military. They would, write, they would write back some of the most unbelievable ministries from base to base to base to base to base, teaching the Word of God to people. They'd have Bible studies. And that was, that was a commonplace. Then they got out of the service, they went in the reserve and did the same thing. That's just one example. That's just one example how some guys get to college, get their college paid for, was an ROTC, and they didn't go just to get it paid for and just to get a college education. They went there to light it up for Christ. That's just one example. And, and then, then you look downstairs, then they just went. I didn't think my son Billy did. I didn't think my son Billy would go. I wasn't supposed to go to the military. I didn't think he'd go. Sole surviving name of the, the heir of the name and yada, yada. Billy came to me one day and said, I'm going to the military, Dad. I want you sure that's what you want to do? Yep. I said, well, why don't you go officer? Why don't you go ROTC? Nope. Nope. Going to regular. I don't, I don't think I want to stay. I just want to go in. I'm going to take four years. I said, why are you going to do that? He says, I'm going to get a scholarship to go to college. I think, listen. I think I have a duty to my country. 
and to your father and my grandfather. You know, I said, Billy, you make me proud, Bubba. You make me proud. So Billy went off. And that's exactly what Billy did when he came back. That's how he got his education. U.S. Army. And he wouldn't have taken anything. Now, listen, not only did he go in, he went into airborne, jumped out of airplanes and all that crazy stuff. <laughs> because of Gary Orton. Don't go the easy way in the military, son. Gary Horton, what, 39 years old or something, some old man uh, jumping out of airplanes. Billy went, I want to do that. I went, okay. I would never jump out of an airplane until the pilot did. <laughs> I'm just saying, I would have never done it. Point three, where am I? John, how much time have I got back there? Am I there? Three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I got 15. Uh, let me, he, I, I got an excited. Let me, let me do point three. Let me just do point three a little bit. I started it. Let me just, did I finish it? I finished, no, I finished it. You can finish the rest. Because I want John Dyer. John Dyer, we, we haven't got that, have we? He didn't, he didn't show up. All right, next Sunday, we'll do something special with you with John Dyer. Um, let me let me do let me do point three since I wanted John Dyer and I had something he wanted to do with you today. We'll, we'll do it next time. Let me do point three, and then the rest of it you can get. In First Thessalonians two ten and eleven, Paul reminds those engaged in, in missionary ministry that they must disciple newborn believers in their salvation. He says, just as you know how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring each one of you. As a father would his own children. What is he talking about? He's talking about the converts, the, the newborn believers in Christ, taking responsibility for them in securing their salvation. As a, as a father would his own children. I, th I thought that was very interesting to me. Very interesting. And why would he do that? Well, this is why we also, because, listen, he understood custodianship. He understood custodianship of evangelism, that was his category. And it's, it's, you preach the gospel, and then you, you confirm the convert. You have to disciple. You either have to stay and do it, give them material that'll do it, or, or send somebody back to do it. That's his, that's his part. When I was with Graham, we did that. We prepared them up front. We did the thing. And then we, listen, we, on the backside, we'd spend a year on the backside being sure that the, the converts were confirmed and placed in churches. You know, the, revi the, revi the actual revival would last about a, a, a week. The preparation would be three years in advance. And the, and the, the aftermath, listen... All the time I was with him, we had more people saved before the... We had more people make professions of faith before before the crusade came. <laughs> before the crusade ever came. They would send me in to promote it. I, I was out in California, and I, I got to speak at the the... The governor's, I, to promote the crusade coming, a, at the governor's breakfast. I sat next to Ronald Reagan, who was the governor. And Mr. Stake on the other side, who was lights out for Christ. I mean, this guy was on fire. And there was, I sat next to, of course, I never knew he was going to be president at that time, but he was pretty, he was pretty bigger in life when he was governor of California. And I passed out, and there was like thousands. And I passed out. They told me how many people, and we passed out invitation cards by their plates for breakfast. 
When I got up, I told them who, who I was and what we were doing and when we were coming and told them how it would be done and gave, told them, presented the gospel. And, gave, and I said, here's how we do it and gave an invitation. I said, instead of coming forward, we're going to ask you to fill out the cards. We bowed our head and had that prayer. And listen, we almost always, when we presented the gospel, had 12% get saved. I don't care where we were. We could be in a bathroom and give the gospel, and we get... I mean, that was our number, 12%. Just everywhere we went. So by the time I did that all, everywhere I went, all the guys I worked with did that. That's what we did. You got to take responsibility. You have to take responsibility for those who get saved. You got to take responsibility for them. You got to disciple them in the Word of God. And, and Hebrews 5.12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again someone teach you again the elementary principles of the oracles of God, which is milk. He tells you it's milk. I'm talking about milk. Milk. What is milk? 1 Peter 2.2, 2, newborn babes desire to sincere pure milk. Breath us. It's a mother's, mother's breast milk kind of thing. That's getting them secured scripturally. What does the Bible say about your eternal salvation? That's what that's what. Well, anyhow, Let's, you can read the rest of that and look it up. Hopefully, you'll do that. So what's the point of our message today? Listen, do this for yourself. Would you do this for yourself? Somewhere in that piece of paper, what is it, write down, not my point. What was the point you got today? What point did God Say, I want you to get this point. What point did you get? My goodness, you need to get a point. What point did God point? He has to point something out to you. What did he point out to you today? Now, I don't want to hear it. because I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want you to tell me what he pointed out. But sometime today, write that down. When you come to Bible study... There's a lot of stuff we talk about, but listen to me. He always is talking to you personally about something. That's why I tell you to write a journal. He's always talking to you about something in your life, asking you, what do you think about this? How are we going to correct this? Do you think, I'm, you think I'm happy with this thing going like it is? Let's talk about it. Come on. What's the Bible say? Come on. Let's talk. You need to pay attention to the Holy Spirit making points with you. I, I, I just spread the sheet out. He makes the points. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth so that he can recall the truth so it can be truth in their life because it is what separates us from the world and the cosmic system of lies. I pray today, Father, we have learned something, some, some aspect of this message has struck our, our heart and our soul. Either about the way we think or about the way we behave or our influence on other people as a witness of God. Something, Father. We've got to walk away with something that's urgent in our life to pinpoint for we've made our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.